Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, February 28th, 2019 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I am uh, Mayor David Narkowitz and I am presiding this evening. I do have to announce to the public that the meeting is being uh, video and audio recorded. Um, I also need to announce that one of our members, at-large school committee member, uh, Susan Voss, um, will be participating tonight via remote participation. So where her nameplate is and where her microphone is, we have a uh, conference phone. Um, so she will be participating via remote participation, which is allowed under uh, Mass General Law and has been authorized uh, here in the city of Northampton. So with that, I will ask the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Ms. Rebecca Busansky. Here. Ms. Laura Fallon. Here. Mr. Howard Moore. Here. Ms. Molly Burnham. Here. Mr. Edward Zahowski. Here. Mayor David Narkowitz. Present. Ms. Susan Voss? Here. No. Oh, here. Here. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Ann Hennessy? Present. Mr. Lonnie Kaufman? Here. Mr. Downey Meyer? Not here. Your Honor, you have a quorum. Thank you very much. Um, the primary uh, purpose of tonight's meeting is to for the first few budget, um, but we do have a, 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 um, some other items. First, are there any announcements from the school committee? Mr. Moore. Uh, my announcement is that the NEF spelling bee is March 27th, it's at 6 p.m. There is food and, of course, entertainment. Um, the other piece of that announcement is that this school committee is going to be number two to enter in the spelling bee. I have been on that team a number of times, despite the fact that I cannot spell. <laughs> and, and, um, and, and so I would be happy to do it again, but it would still require two more people. And if there were three other people besides me, that would be excellent. So look at your calendar. It's uh, March 27th. Ms. Pusansky. Yes, I want to let everyone know that, um, and try and save the date and hopefully come, Saturday, April 6th from 9 to 1 is the first annual Northampton Farm to School Summit. And it's going to be held at the Northampton Community Arts Trust at 33 Holly Street. And it's being put together by a group including Grow Food Northampton, School Sprouts, and our own food services director, Ms. Del Hanna. I'm just going to read the uh, description so everyone gets a sense of what it's about. It's, um, it will bring together stakeholders and enthusiasts interested in connecting kids to healthy food and local farms in the school environment. Northampton Public Schools have made great progress with school gardens and cooking workshops at the elementary level and local procurement for school food, but there is much more we can do. At this gathering, we will come together to learn about current successes and challenges, gather input, and create a unified vision for how to take this work forward. Uh, registration is located on Grow Food Northampton's homepage. It is free, there is childcare available, and teacher stipends and we're hoping to get a broad group from all levels, um, all school levels and different types, administrators, teachers, parents, students, etc. Okay. Um, Actually it should be online as of like four minutes ago. Okay. Uh, all right, there's a question about that. It is online. Okay, so for those of you who are watching at home, the slideshow behind me is going to be, is available on the school committee website, correct? Uh, also, it was just tweeted. Oh, it was just tweeted, actually. Sorry. Um, he did that with no hands. It was amazing. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Um, and while we're making announcements, I'd like to um, tell the community that uh, the Northampton High School uh, musical, Grease, is being done on March 14th, 15th, and then two shows on the 16th. And you can get tickets on brown paper bag. And it should be amazing. Um, they are working really hard and really late into the night to make an awesome show. So, come out. Any, oh, Miss Hennessy. Yeah, I don't know if anyone else is going to, but I will. Um, also this Saturday from 12 to 3 is the Volunteers in Northampton School, the Vintage Dog Show. Oh, that's right. Um, at Northampton High School. Is anyone judging the you know? Yes. There you go. <laughs> it's really fun. And uh, the snow day, I don't know if it's going to snow, but it's Sunday. There's a parade beforehand. And there's a parade. Yes. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll, marshal, I'll, be, I'll be the marshal. <laughs> I'll be leading the dogs. Um, anything else? <laughs> okay, so um, that is that concludes our announcements. Um, we do have one vote this evening, and it is a vote to accept 
uh, Northampton Education Foundation SOS Book Fund um, in the amount of $19,910. And I will turn to Ms. Fallon, who's our soon-to-be former NEF uh, liaison, to yeah, give that report. My last responsibility as the liaison for the NEF, um, and Mr. Moore is already ready to take over. Um, so um, the Northampton Education Foundation SOS Book Fund um, is primarily funded through the spring plant sale. Um, and the money that they raise is um, distributed among Northampton residents on a per capita basis through all the schools. Um, and it's designated for textbooks, library books, educational materials, and their electronic and technical uh, equivalents. This year's check is for $19,910. And I would move for us to accept that um, check with gratitude. Second. second. Motion made and motion seconded. Any discussion about this uh, gift from NEF? Mr. Yes. Moore. I'd like to point out that the major source of funding for that gift comes from a plant sale, which is Saturday, May 11th, <laughs> which is the day before Mother's Day. It's held from 9 to noon at Smith Folk. Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded to accept this gift from NEF. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. So uh, it's unanimous. Okay. So next we move to the main uh, purpose of this evening, and that is Superintendent Provost's uh, first view FY20 budget presentation. <laughs> I'm going to lose this. Thank you very much. Convocation and the first view budget. There are cans on our feet. 108 and 109. Don't forget to stop by our art wing. <laughs> All right, so there, my first line is blown already. Um, <laughs> let me just say that there will be commercial interruptions for approximately the first 20 minutes of this presentation um, due to spotlight tonight at JFK. Also, that is the reason why Miss Wilson isn't here presently, but she will be here in a little while. So what I was going to say is that the, the two highlights of a superintendent's calendar, at least my calendar, are convocation and the first view budget. Work begins on the first view budget immediately after we return from Thanksgiving break. And so... We are proud to host the student band Misconception. Join us in the cafeteria for a great show starting at 7. Once again, we are hosting the student band Misconception. Join us in the cafeteria for a great show starting at 7. And so I'm so happy they're proud of that because we're very proud of the budget that we're bringing you tonight too. Um, we'll just start with a word about our logo for this year. As, as is the case with every year, we have a little symbol for the budget. Last year, if you remember, it was a Karen because we were building on what we had done in years past. This year, our symbol is the phases of the moon because we are transitioning, we think, with this budget from a time of intense focus on the elementary schools. I think it was necessary with two of the elementary schools in level three status um, at the beginning of my administration that we spend a lot of time with a very close focus on the elementaries. But now we're moving to a, a more balanced uh, focus between both the elementaries and secondary schools. So that is the meaning of the moons. Let me start with some appreciations. All of the appreciations you see tonight are from my Twitter feed over the course of the year. One of the things I like to do to prepare for first view is just review the tweets of the last year to um, see what we've done well and what is memorable for me. So first I'd like to just thank everyone who played a role in bringing Project Lead the Way to the middle school, including the school committee for supporting that in the budget last year. For me, I think this is an exemplar of hands-on learning with relevance and rigor, which is the way students learn best and what I'd like to bring a lot more of to the Northampton Public Schools. 
skipped ahead. Also, unified sports. I can remember in my former life as a special education director, sitting with parents and students at high school IEP meetings as they describe the heartache they experienced when they reached the age at which sports participation was contingent on athletic skill. From a moral perspective, I think establishing a unified sports program is perhaps the best single thing we've done this year because that reverses that whole dynamic. To see our stands packed with students, the pep band and the cheerleaders there to support students who normally wouldn't be allowed to participate in athletic programs, um, to me was, I think, the moral highlight of the year. Also, our community spirit. Some more scenes from earlier this fall. Um, on the left, you see the Bridge Street walking school bus. You see the driver, Howard Moore, getting ready to round up his band of merry walkers with support from Principal Chiquette, the new Bridge Street teacher, Jill Tellier, Counselor Shiera, and Mayor Narkowitz. Uh, also from the fall on the right is our first ever school local carnival bringing all four elementary schools together in a unified um, celebration of the public schools. It was a bracing 50 degrees and overcast with a steady northerly breeze. Um, it was perfect dunk tank weather, <laughs> at least for, from the perspective of students who wanted to even the score with the superintendent who doesn't call enough snow days. Um, also, I, I want to just shout out to Dave since he's here. He uh, actually went beyond his shift, took some time for somebody else on that, that very chilly day. So thanks for that. But that was, that was a, definitely a highlight of the year. I also want to appreciate our new colleagues. We have welcomed 90 through 93 employees into the district since July 1st, and they have enriched us with new perspectives and new energy, and I think we're definitely a better and stronger district for the new employees we've added. We've also added several non-human employees. <laughs> uh, I apologize to all or for not Oliver for not including him on the slide. Uh, apparently he hasn't made the Twitter feed yet. Uh, fortunately, dogs are relatively immune from many of the human defects, including jealousy, vanity, and um, avarice. So I don't expect to have any complaints from Oliver tomorrow morning. Um, but as you can see from the picture on the left, our four like friends were loved by students, teachers, and administrators alike. And I'll just point out, um, from that picture. This was one of those days when it was like 100 degrees and everyone was miserable, but Jackson, I think, really sort of leavened the spirit and helped us get through the day. Uh, so those are my appreciations looking back on what we were able to do in the past budget. Next, um, this is a very important slide. The whole budget is really contingent on this slide. Um, so I want to have it right up in, in the beginning. Through our prior, prior budget cycles, almost all of our new programming had to be created through restructuring, as you know. Um, since 2015, we've added more than $800,000 of new programming, most of which came from cuts from various line items, and most of which were directed... Attention JFK! Attention JFK! Join us in the cafeteria for a great show starring the student band, Misconception, at this time. Once again, make your way to the cafeteria for a great show starring the student band, Misconception, at this time. So let me just back up because this is the, the really important slide to understand. As I said, from 2015, we've added about $800,000 of new programming mostly cut from other line items, mostly directed to priority needs, most of which have been related to what I've referred to as the high needs future. Um, in this year, in 2020, we're able to do almost as much in a single year as we've been able to do over the course of the past five budget cycles. And it's because of this slide. 
That's a really important opportunity for us. Um, new programming in this proposal is paid for savings and new revenue from the Special Education Cost Center. The budget assumes that increases in the local appropriation will be consistent with the Northampton Fiscal Stability Plan, but does not rely on the appropriation for the increased programming. Our assumption is that the increased appropriation will go to fixed cost increases <coughs> to maintain level services. So all of the, I'll be talking about this tonight. This is the PTO in the main entrance. Stop by to learn about the many ways the PTO supports our teachers and students. And be sure to leave your email. So all the funding in the new budget comes from this, this slide and um, these fundamentals that I'm showing here. Our budget philosophy is rooted in an ethic of stewardship. We believe that resources are used most wisely when cost center managers reap the benefits of increased efficiency and are held fiscally responsible for educational inefficiencies. There's also an element of luck. And we believe that when fortune smiles on us, all the cost centers should benefit. And when we run into bad luck, each cost center has to bear its share of the burden. So this money is available due to the good stewardship of the many cost center managers who are here tonight. And so it's very important that this money be reinvested in those cost centers in priorities that they've helped to identify. Speaking of those priorities, here they are. First, to replicate effective practices from our elementary schools, to seek new solutions to improve outcomes, to meet the needs of a changing population, to provide <coughs> adequate administrative support, to enhance math and arts education, and to improve the quality of experience. So, it may be somewhat countercultural after years of focus on level three elementary schools to hear that we now believe our elementary schools have practices that we believe should be extended to the secondary level. Uh, of course, we no longer have the old five level system, but I think the public should know that if we did, every single one of our schools now would be level one or level two. So um, many of the things that have been done in the elementary schools are very effective and have caught the attention of administrators from other levels. And the first thing we're going to talk about tonight are proposals in the budget to extend some of those practices that we've really worked on and developed to a high level in the elementary schools to the secondary level. I do want to provide some support for the statement. Um, so I have some graphs to show. Um, as you can see from this chart, it is the elementary schools that are showing the greatest growth especially in the all-important high-need subgroup. The high-need subgroup is important not only because it is growing in numbers, but also because we're experiencing a ceiling effect among non-high-need students. Looking at the grade 10 results, for example, you should know that the performance of the non-high-need students has been pegged at more than 99.5 out of 100 possible points for the last two years. So there's no more performance potential from that group. Um, performance improvements are only possible by increasing the achievement of the high needs subgroup. And you can see it's the elementary schools that really seem to have figured out how to do that. This is math. You see a similar pattern in mathematics. The state actually showed no improvement in mathematics in grades three through five but Northampton did, and the improvement for our high needs subgroup was equal to the improvement for students in the aggregate. Again, you can see pretty stark contrast between the elementaries and the secondary. In science, the, uh, we have a little bit of a different picture. Um, here, Elementary and middle schools both showed strong improvements with JFK leading the way, especially with the high needs subgroup. Um, again, the state showed regression across the board in middle schools, but JFK middle school um, showed improvement both in the high needs subgroup and for all students. Uh, we are pleased also with the results of our RTI program. 
from the elementary school. I'm going to use the term tiered support tonight. It's more of an umbrella term. We have talked a lot in the past about RTI, so when you hear me say tiered support or tier two supports, you can know that I'm referring to our RTI program. Of course, the twofold goal of our tiered support system is to provide timely identification of students who may require special education and also to intervene quickly when learning problems first appear in the hope that many problems can be resolved before they develop into learning disabilities. So in this graph you see over the past three years in the blue the number of students who received a tier two intervention, an RTI intervention on the left in reading and the right in math and then in the red of that group how many of those went on to require tier three support or special education support. Um, so you can see we've provided hundreds of interventions and have been able to resolve the overwhelming majority of learning differences without having refer students to tier three. Um, the result has been a dramatically lower incidence of students with disabilities in grades K to two where we have the program in place. This slide shows um, some more context. Here the colors are different, so just to point that out. The blue line shows the special education incidence in grades pre-K to five. The red line shows incidence in grades six through eight. Um, so even though we've only been able to put tier two supports in place in grades K through two for the most part, you can see that we've definitely seen a, a decrease in our incidence of special education, incidence of learning disabilities in the elementary schools over the past several years. And so for some more context, the current incidence rate in Massachusetts is 18.1%. You can see that the elementary schools are just slightly higher above that right now and trending downward at the middle school the incidence rate has been well above the statewide average for the whole period and is trending slightly upward. And the reason all this matters is that inappropriate placement of students into special education slows learning not only for those students who would be better served in the general education setting, but also for the students who really require intensive interventions and can't afford to have their teachers' efforts diluted by large caseloads. So, the first set of investments we are proposing to make, and it's the largest chunk of the available funds, is to expanding Tier 2 supports. These moves will allow us to support students not only from grades K to 2, but all the way through grade 8. The additional uh, positions at the elementary schools will extend services already in place there, so um, we're not going to talk too much about that. But you do have at your, your tables a one-pager explaining the middle school tiered support program um, because that is a completely new program and I would just like to take a minute to share our thoughts on how that would work. So we have three areas that we want to provide tiered support at JFK Middle School. The first is in the area of academic engagement. The intervention model is check in, check out. It's the tier two level that goes with um, PBIS. So PBIS is sort of the general building level um, support for students. But there are some students who aren't reached by that general intervention. There's a small group, research says that it's about 10% of the population who needs something more. And the, the tier two intervention that goes with the PBIS model is called check-in and check-out. It involves students who've been nominated by their teachers as um, starting to disengage from school, meeting with a teacher first thing in the morning to make a plan for the day, meeting with a teacher at the end of the day to debrief the day and make a plan for the night. Um, so first part of the JFK model will be adding check-in, check-out. Second, um, in English language arts, we want to provide a true RTI model by redistributing the reading teachers that we currently have 
Um, formerly known as Title I, reading it at JFK, although that's not their funding source anymore. Um, and with two different models. The model for sixth grade um, is developmental reading instruction for a full year, group size of 10 to 15 students. We would anticipate approximately two or three classes um, and would be providing monthly progress monitoring and oral reading fluency, reading comprehension, and vocabulary. This um, is different than the intervention at grade seven because grade six, the focus is one last attempt to try to teach students decoding skills, essentially. Um, by the time you get to grade seven, it's a little bit late for that. Um, so the model looks different and the focus is different. In grades seven and eight, uh, the focus is to support um, students in their English language arts class using the same reading teachers who are currently at JFK as a push-in model um, so that they can be an additional teacher in the classroom in the ELA classes, helping students who have difficulty reading, making sure that they can still access the grade level content that's part of the seventh and eighth grade curriculum. In math, um, again, you'll see a difference. This is on the second, at the back, Side, I should say it's a two-sided handout. In math, again, there's a difference between sixth grade and seventh and eighth grade. Again, because the research done on RTI at the secondary level says it has to be different than the, the way RTI is conducted at the elementary level. And grade six is a really critical year. It's a year when the developmental window for remediation is really starting to close. And so um, you want to intensify your efforts with the sixth graders. Um, so uh, the grade six intervention model be math recovery. It's the same model that's used in the elementary schools. You might ask, well, if we're providing um, RTI in the elementary schools or tiered supports in the elementary schools, why do we have to provide it in the middle school too? Um, you know, wouldn't they have a chance to benefit from that in elementary school? Well, we did look at the current JFK population um, and looking at the grades one through three, even though we're not really um, providing much RTI at grade level three. And 150 students currently in JFK joined the Northampton Public Schools in grade three or later. Um, and a lot of them joined in grade seven or eight. So having a RTI program or tiered support program at the elementary school doesn't ensure that we'll be able to have an opportunity to work with all the students who might need it before they get to JFK Middle School. Um, just continuing with the math model, um, so for seven and eight, um, really it's, a, it's about sessions. Um, so this isn't, this isn't a full year model, it's a 20 session model. Um, the focus is really two things, 10 minutes on advanced topics in arithmetic, such as long division. There are some kids at the middle school who are missing some basic arithmetic skills and that becomes a problem um, in all other, all other math endeavors. Um, and then the rest of it is spent on explicit strategy instruction. A lot of it's spent on understanding and solving word problems um, because that's where a lot of students have um, trouble. In both sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, the progress monitoring is with math computation fluency, number computation fluency, and math concepts and applications. We also, you'll notice, um, don't have the same kind of elaborate screening measures that we have at the elementary school, and that's because it's another difference between elementary screening for RTI and secondary screening for RTI. Um, most people thinking about secondary models now say, you don't have to spend a lot of time <coughs> screening kids. In elementary, you're doing assessments to try to find kids prior to the age when your state assessment system comes on board. By the time they get into the middle school, they've already been through so many assessments, you know which kids are struggling, and the state assessment, whatever it is, um, is a good way of picking the kids out. So save time on assessment and put more time on the Don't intervention. Forget, on your way out, be sure to ask about Ask in the Lobby. Okay, so that, um, that does it for the tiered support portion of the budget. 
you want us to hold on questions, John? I think doing it now will be easier than just going back and forth. All right, so behavioral support, how does that fit into, I understand the academic piece. Why are you combining the two, I'm curious? Because we envision the need for supports as a, tri as a tripod or a stool with three legs. Yep. There's reading support, because reading is one area where students can go off the rails. There's math support because that's a, a large part of the curriculum. But then there's behavioral support because even if students have solid academic skills, if they're not engaged, if they're not um, exhibiting pro-social behaviors at a high frequency, they're going to receive a lot of negative feedback from the system that's going to cause them to check out of learning. Okay, now I, I totally get the idea behind that, but you see one person having that, uh, that responsibility to serve kids who have both academic and or behavioral needs that, that are... I don't think it'll necessarily be one person. Yeah, awesome. Um, so if you think it's 10%, that might be 20 kids per grade. It might be a different person in each grade doing the check-in, check-out. All right, I guess I'm just looking at trying to understand that better if this is at a one one FTE does that mean the equivalent of that, that would okay be I, I understand the confusion now okay sorry um, so the on this we're uh, just showing the two math interventionists that we're adding to JFK middle school another piece of this puzzle is the change in population that the middle school is going through so um, to give you the most extreme example of the difference that I think our tiered supports are making. In grades seven and eight right now, about 29% of students are identified as students with disabilities. I think there are 64 eighth graders, I think it's 30% in that grade, that are leaving uh, for the high school or for uh, uh, the vocational school next year. They're being replaced by 46 incoming sixth graders. Mm -hmm. So there are fewer students coming in, that's gonna free up staff. Okay. Also, and this is really important, in the 64 eighth graders we currently have right now, 100% of them have learning strategies in their IEPs. In the incoming sixth grade, 0% of the students have learning strategies in their IEPs because we've had a more inclusive model at the elementary school. Mm -hmm. So that frees up more time. So I don't think that, it's not the math interventionists that are gonna do the behavioral support. I believe it will likely be special educators who have a, a low, lesser caseload. One of the things you'll see is that we're actually, to make sure that works out, um, proposing to add another special educator to JFK in spite of the fact that they're, you know, having a big group leave and having a small group come in. Does okay. that? help with that yeah but, and so what about the elementary schools then that that particular <coughs> FTE is that a single person that you envision for the for uh, bridge and Leeds yes that's okay. a single person well it's a single person for each school yeah who yeah. cool. okay so I guess I'm still confused so it's a single person at each school who's going to provide both academic and behavioral support yes it is, I guess, is it, is it providing academic and behavioral support or is it, be, or is it providing uh, instructional support regardless of what the student's needs are? Do you know what I mean? Like, no, I think it's the first. I yeah. think it's providing academic and behavioral support. Um, one of the things that we know when you go back to that stool analogy is that many of the kids who are having academic problems are also kids who are having behavioral problems. So. Um, in some cases, you're addressing the behavior problems by helping the academics. In yeah. some cases, you're helping the academics by addressing the behavior. In some cases, you have to address them both separately. And so are those, do we currently have those positions by that we, title? We have, we have uh, what are known as tiered support specialists, and we have math interventionists and reading interventionists in all of our elementary schools. So, but their time is all used up basically taking the cases from K to two. With these additional supports, we think we can take the cases from three to five. The one exception you'll see up here is Jackson, which is a little bit of a different um, model. They've said what would really help them more so than one of these um, academic and behavior people is a BCBA. That's because 
as we're implementing our more inclusive model that allows students to stay in their home schools, students with autism are now staying at Jackson. Um, formerly they would go to Bridge Street, but now um, many of them stay at Jackson and so they need the kinds of supports that are more uh, appropriate for students with autism. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. What, what does point six seven look like then? It's not a full time person. How are you configuring that? So it's an increase to full time. There's currently a point three three. Okay, moving on to the next strategy, which is seeking new solutions to improve outcomes. Uh, it's the second largest investment that we're making in the uh, pot of money that we think is available. <coughs> and the first thing that we want to do in the area of new solutions is to establish a position for a director of equity, diversity, and analytics. This comes as a recommendation from our equity and diversity committee, which has been very active since our FY18 anti-bias initiative. We have some of them here tonight to talk about the position, but before I bring them up, I just want to say that I think many on the ALT team feel that this one position here is really the soul of our proposal. Uh, many of our proposals are based on a very rational process of trying to figure out how to put our dollars to the highest use for the sake of achievement. Uh, but here, I think what you'll, what you'll hear when people from the group who have been working on this come up is that they're speaking to you directly from their souls and they're speaking about a hunger felt by those who do not always feel included in Northampton's embrace of diversity. And so if, if you would allow, I'd like to let the members who were part of this recommendation just talk a little bit more about the position. Sure. Hi, thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak with you. Uh, my name is Norm Pacheco. I am a special educator here at JFK. I am also the co-chair of the anti-bias committee that Dr. Provost spoke of. Um, I, uh, in addition to being a teacher here at JFK, I'm also a husband to a Northampton teacher and probably more importantly a father to a Northampton student. Um, and as such, I'm invested in Northampton's future. I want us to flourish and to be successful. With that being said, Northampton schools are not immune to the national trends, such as students of color uh, being overrepresented on our list of low achievers and overrepresented on our list of um, behavior problems. Um, low, socio low socioeconomic um, students and people of color, the two groups often uh, blend um, and um, are often the same kids. Um, and, and in order to address this situation, we need a position like this in the district, I feel. Uh, one of the, the um, hopes for this position um, would be to recruit other teachers of color. Uh, research shows that teachers of color help um, to close achievement gaps for students of color um, and um, tend to be highly regarded by all by students of all races. Um, recruitment would hopefully, um, you know, bring in more people that would also affect, um, you know, decrease dropout rates, increase um, aspirations for college, things like that. Um, another aspect of this position that would be helpful would be the provision of professional development for the staff members of the district. Um, as populations and demographics change um, and more students of color enroll within the district, this is definitely needed. Um, as we know, diversity creates um, both opportunity and challenges to a school. Um, the opportunities are endless, right? Building tolerance, building um, 
acceptance, things like that. The challenges could be, you know, finding curriculum that um, reaches all of our students, um, that is relevant to all of our students, that meets the needs of a, stu a diverse student population. Um, we want to make sure the school promotes uh, a culture that um, supports tolerance and understanding. Um, this is not as easily done as said done as it is said. Um, one central strategy for addressing these concerns must involve providing support for teachers and school staff. That's what this position would do. Um, this position can provide to teachers with proper training to successfully teach diverse schools and become reflective about potential biases that they may bring into the classroom. Um, you know, and sometimes we've seen in our neighboring communities, you know, there are issues that arise based on race relations that can be difficult to talk about. Those conversations are hard to have. Um, and again, this person could potentially um, take on that role of leading those conversations and coming to a solution with all involved. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, so I, I appreciate that presentation and I um, agree that this is a need. I'm wondering why I have time. It's what we think that we can afford within the budget right now. We, um, as a group, talked about looking for grant funding to see if we can increase it. Um, right now, just to be honest, the outlook on the federal grants is kind of bleak, um, so I don't know that we'll be able to move beyond that this year. But um, in the, the great sort of mixing pot of, of what the priorities were and, and where we thought that we could get the appropriate and best mix of services for the district, that's where we landed. So do you envision the, the person part-time employee or someone who has another position in the school? I think it's a part-time employee. I think this person is just focused on this. So, Hello again, everyone. Kennedy Principal Wilson. What a great night. We hope you enjoyed exploring your middle school. Thank you for being here at JFK Spotlight. We were very excited to meet you, and we look forward to seeing you again this spring. Most of all, we can't wait until you are JFK students and families. Thanks again for attending, and have a nice evening. So I guess my concern with this um, is that I believe in this strongly, and I think it's almost ironic that it would be a half-time position given who could afford to take a half-time job, mm -hmm. and that the, the, the mission or the charge of this position would be to both have an understanding of the issues of um, what we're dealing with in Northampton. So that's a concern of mine. So I have strong concern. I wish it was a full time. I, I get that it's a budget. I I will just share with you that. Up, sorry. Go ahead. What do you want, Susan? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, Susan. Sorry, I, I don't have a way to visualize. I'm not trying to interrupt. I'm just um, I was I'm on the subcommittee, and we I wanted to just share part of our conversation about this. I'm on the um, budget subcommittee, and we saw a preview of this and. Dr. Provost can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it had an amount attached to it, which really helped our conversation. I don't want to say the amount I remember, but this person, um, Dr. Provost, will you just summarize for us the level of education you think this person has? Because that might be, a, I agree with what Ms. Hennessy is saying, um, but it's a much higher paying position than you might we might be thinking and the question is how to afford and and i had the same concerns how are we going to find somebody because it's such an important position right so it's a cabinet level position uh the amount that we have in the budget is fifty thousand or in the proposal is fifty thousand dollars for this half time position um we're looking for somebody with some kind of advanced degree really the main thing is someone with experience um so I don't know, but you know, we're, we will continue to look for grants, um, and if we can find a way to expand it, that certainly is our goal. I mean, we had this very same discussion when we were um, in 
before the, the subcommittee, when we were, I think, on day three of our budget um, development as an alt team, and the way we were able to move was by saying maybe there will be we able to get some grants to help build this up, and maybe we'll be able to build it up through future budgets. But we recognize that potential problem too. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. can, can I offer one idea related to that? Yes. You have the floor. Thank you. Um, I've had a couple weeks to think about this, and one of the things we talked about was, you know, this is probably a fair, an advanced degree kind of position, and people um, in those types of positions often do have a research component, obviously, of what they're doing, and do write grants. So it may be that when we think about a job description for this position, initially, if we can, if we can only fund it half time, the job description could include something like you know, uh, opportunity to write grants to create a full-time job. Okay, thank you. Ms. Uh, Fallon. And I, I actually was going to say something related. Um, when we talk about equity, last night was the meeting of all six PTOs from the district, and that's an issue that came up, is the um, issue of equity and what each school community is able to raise and which schools have very wealthy benefactors or have parents who are very um, willing and able to write for grant applications um, and it was suggested that maybe you know this needs to be a district funded position of grant writer so that the money is dispersed equally amongst all six schools and you don't have that um, kind of the schools elementaries in particular fighting against each other for the same resources um, and so I, I would love to see this be a bigger position for the reasons that Ms. Hennessy mentioned and also for reasons of equity for, for someone who's able to take on that role of grant writing because our PTOs are contributing a ridiculous amount of money to supporting our schools and I don't think it's a sustainable model um, and it definitely contributes to some um, some problems in, in building that sense of community. I think there's a sense of competition for resources. So I would love to see it if that if grant writing was somehow incorporated into it, not just to fund the position, but also to fund grants for the schools. So I guess I would say I'm a little bit concerned, my first reaction to that, of watering the position down too much. Um, we already have analytics connected to it. You might have wondered why that was kind of a strange because <laughs> we also wanted to have someone to help um, principals with their data. Um, we felt that it was that was kind of an okay mix with this because a lot of what the person is going to be doing is saying look at here's your underperforming list. Do you see any patterns here? You know? Um, and I, I think that the idea of maybe the person being involved in the search for more funds for their own position is a appropriate idea but i wouldn't want the person who's supposed to be helping us get better with equity and diversity also be the person who's looking to try to get all the grants um, you know maybe that is another idea maybe that's a different track for a, a grant writer within the position to some uh, the district to some extent but i wouldn't want I'd be afraid of the grant writing piece overcoming, you know, overwhelming the diversity piece of this position. Just my first gut reaction. Yeah, I, I, I agree with what you're saying. I just, I was thinking more of the equity piece at that point. Which is a, which is a huge problem. Right. Would probably be more can, I, can I say one more thing? Um, actually, Ms. Uh, we have one other person who has a hand up, and then you'll be next. Yes, Mr. Collins. Sure. Oh, thank you. Um, so I, mean, I thank you for the presentation, Norm. I mean, I, I think the goals are, are our goals, my goals, the, the objective, and, and what you're trying to accomplish and what you brought up is fantastic. But I'll admit I'm concerned. And um, I'm concerned about a few things. One is I've been in other districts that have this type of position. and. Um, two things happen. One is that the position itself becomes the solution and the, um, the efforts to take on this task system-wide then falls to the excuse, I don't want to call it an excuse, but there's a problem that arises and everyone says, oh, that director will take care of it. Or 
we better talk to that person to get some sort of help. And all of a sudden, what seems to be a systemic issue becomes an isolated one. And in that sense, it backfires. And I, I'm thinking of one particular case. It was a while back. And I'm not saying that will happen here. But that's just one of my concerns is um, this is a, a huge problem. And every, you know, of all the issues that Norm brought up are the issues that many school systems have. And I don't know if there's a solution. Um, and I'd love to have a solution. But I, I would. If you have the opportunity, Dr. Provost, I know you do get to talk to other superintendents, I would ask you to look at others that have tried this and maybe there's a particular job description or a particular niche that this person can do that they can really talk about the differences they made. Because I, I, this has to be more than a feel good kind of thing. And it seems like an impossible task for one person to do, honestly. So if there is one person that can do it or one type of individual, one type, uh, somebody who has the responsibility, um, what am I trying to say? If we can define the responsibilities for a person to carry it through because they've had a track record of success, then that would be thrilling. And, and I think the thing that jazzed me the most was curriculum, like if somebody has an impact on curriculum. Um, but the other things about you know trying to hire a diverse uh, workforce, I, I just have no confidence a person can do that because we've tried before, other districts have tried, we're in a grant. It's a huge problem and I, I just don't think that's going to do it. If it did, great. Um, and having somebody support teachers, I don't know if teachers are going to welcome this. I don't know if teachers are going to be acceptance, uh, accepting of it. So I have some concerns. I love the idea of what we're trying to accomplish, but I don't want this to be something where we're spending that kind of money on an individual if there's another way to do it. Um, and the, the other way, I would think, is using it for somebody who maybe has these same objectives but is really solely looking at curriculum uh, teaching and instruction, because I do think that's where we'll get the most impact. Um, and that needs to be defined, but if we're, gonna, if we're talking about equity and diversity around student achievement, then I think it needs to be more, more in the classroom. And so that's my two cents. I, I, lo I, I love, like I, I'm just going to say it again, <laughs> I love what we're trying to accomplish, but I, I do ask Dr. Provost if we can do a little bit more research and what other districts that have tried this have learned from it. So, uh, if you haven't already, it sounds yeah, like I was going to say the <laughs> next step of this, if this passes muster with this with the full committee, yeah. would be to bring forward a job description, which is a job description that was developed um, based on the research of the diversity subcommittee. Um, I will speak to the the point about um, the level of acceptance, um, yeah. which was the one major change that I made, because um, initially the, the subcommittee recommended this being a unit A position, um, but I don't think it can work as a unit A position for the reason you point out. Um, I think that some of the conversations that are most difficult may be with some of the people who are least ready to accept them, and I think from teacher to teacher, members of the same unit, that there's no leverage there. But I think from administrator to whoever, um, there's that level of, um, that level of legitimacy, that level of authority that I think can help um, move someone forward in an area where they don't want to move into. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. That makes a lot of sense. And I would just then ask whether the all team or whether the school building principals are going to welcome somebody coming in and working directly with their teachers. And if that's true, that's a real plus. But if well, that's not true, then that's a real barrier that needs to be resolved. I can say that every position in this in this proposal is fully supported by the alt team. And this position in particular, um, we were debating whether or not it should be reduced in order to add some more academic support. And um, it was very clear that the principals felt that this should be prioritized over more academic support for students. Okay, um, thank you. That's good to know. Thank you. Yeah. Ms. Voss. Thanks. Um, I'll just keep it quick. I think when I first saw this position, um, coming back to what Ms. Hennessy said, it felt super important. and. Um, at the same time, I, I think we're all feeling, or I'll speak for myself, this, the title of it is so broad it could be an entire department, and then you see half time on it. So I think that job description will be really helpful in helping understand what the goals are and setting somebody up 
to succeed at this job because it, it is such a broad art. Um, and I just wanted to clarify what I was saying about the grant writing. Um, because of the way this position was described to me and the likely piece of having an advanced degree for whoever was hired for it, um, th there are probably people out there that want a part-time job at some stage in their life. And this could be a really attractive one at a high level doing important work. But if there was an issue with it being 0.5, um, the word I would use would, I, w I wouldn't say the grant writing should be necessarily part of the job. It's just you can talk about soft money and sometimes people can increase from half time to full time by writing grants on their own time if they so choose. So I wasn't suggesting put that as part of the expectation for the job, but just during the process of talking to candidates, having that in the back of the mind that maybe it could be a soft money position. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Burnham. I just want to say that um, I think this is amazing, and I also think it's really great that it came out of the equity. Um, uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm, my the, the your community, which is made up of teachers, um, and and um, members of the staff, and I think that it's coming from that is very powerful for me to see. So thank you, Ms. Busansky. I, I, I'm also excited about this position. I agree with the hesitation about it being half time, but I think we've kind of fleshed out some potential. But I want to say that I think it's really important, this idea of working on more teacher diversity. And so I don't want to lose that, and I don't think you will. But I think that's an important part, not just on based on what the um, equity committee uh, presented uh, to us, but I think from what we know and what we're really talking about is that kids, uh, that our students need to have those role models and have those connections. So I don't want to lose that in all of this. I'm not saying it's an easy task, and I know you, Dr. Provost, have been involved in a group working on that, sort of regionally, if I'm correct, That's right? Correct. Um, and so maybe we've learned something, you know, from from that that we can then apply. But um, I think that's a really important point. We really look at our teacher body, and we have so little diversity in Northampton. And I think to increase that is going to be really important, so that we're reflecting what our uh, student population looks like better, and give that help to them. So I just wanted to put in a good word for keeping that. Hey, so moving along. It may be somewhat of a misnomer to put Munis on automation on the new solutions um, slide because I was doing things with Munis 15 years ago that we can't do in Northampton right now. Um, Munis, for those of you who don't know, is the financial um, record keeping system that uh, many municipalities and school districts use. Um, it has a number of functions um, that are now kind of in a sleep mode in Northampton that are leading to um, lost time, additional work, additional errors as people double enter things. Um, and so this solution is really kind of a one-time cost of bringing in a consultant who would have to make some uh, tweaks within the system, but also to do training to the Munis for the Munis users, so that we can really uh, maximize U Munis, or even just use it the way it was intended to be used. Um, so the next batch of new solutions is all for the high school. First, there's a halftime innovation pathway coordinator included in the budget. That's because the grant for the current. Uh, innovation Pathway Coordinator is scheduled to phase out halfway through next year. The um, Every meeting I go to for Pathway Schools still says that the governor is very committed to creating a separate funding stream for schools who have Innovation Pathways. Um, however, I didn't see it in the governor's budget proposal. Um, but anyways, if that comes to fruition, that might be more money that we could use um, in another another spot such as the director of equity diversity and analytics however at this point not really seeing anything sure on the horizon we want to put that position that halftime position in there so that we don't have to send the integrated integration innovation pathway director home during january of next year um, next a post-grad transition coordinator um, one of 
I did get a question on this um, from a committee member who said, weren't we cited on transition planning in our last CPR? And we were, um, which may be another reason to um, support this position. Although I want to be clear, this is not an administrative position in order to just make sure that we are um, compliance with all the paperwork components of transition planning. This is a person who would actually provide direct services to students 18 to 22 um, who are currently already completed high school graduation requirements but still have a few years of eligibility for special education services. In my opinion, having them in the high school is not an inclusive model. Um, because students that old, their peers are in the community. And so the programming for them needs to be in the community. However, um, our schools are mainly set up for, to do things inside of schools. So this uh, post-grad transition coordinator half-time position would be to work with that 18 to 22 population that we currently have in the high school and currently really struggle to provide any kind of relevant and meaningful programming for. Um, next is the next one of our one-pagers. We do also have some one-pagers for the public if anyone wants any of these. Um, it's the Twilight Academy. Um, so the goal of this solution is student re-engagement. Um, we have a fairly steady population of about 10 students a year who drop out of high school who we then re-engage in high school, who then drop out again. Um, and this has been a fairly consistent pattern for several years. And uh, I guess finally we're learning that if we bring students back to the high school they dropped out of, they're just gonna drop out again. So what we'd like to do is try to create a different experience that may be more meaningful um, for that population that either has dropped out and come back or is telling us they're about to drop out. Um, so the emphasis here again is going to be on community-based learning. The reason why is because the goal is still to get students a high school diploma, but the usual reasons that we give for why students should get a high school diploma don't really mean anything to this group of kids. Um, what will mean something to this group of kids is if they have a relationship with a caring adult who can have a loving but very real conversation with them that goes something like, look at, you're not worth much to me or anybody else right now without a high school diploma, but if you can get this, then I can get you more money and I can get some doors open for you. Um, and that's gonna be the motivation. So um, students will be in this program morning when the rest of the students are in the high school engaged in some community-based learning could be paid employment ideally would be paid employment because I think that's where they'll find those mentors that I'm talking about it could be volunteer work if um, they're not able to find paid employment or other kind of practical learning experiences then um, they'd have a modified schedule um, so they would learn from two to four be after the regular high school day um, and we're also focusing on a subject a day model because some of these students have kind of Swiss cheese transcripts that they only need one or two more courses in order to graduate we probably have more luck telling them you can come on Mondays for the rest of the semester we can get you your diploma um, so this is kind of just a sample schedule of what it might look like Monday English, Tuesday Math, Wednesday Science, Thursday History, and Friday Makeup, in case you missed a day. Um, so it also has the benefit of, I do think there's a certain stigma, certain embarrassment um, for students being overage in the for their grade, and also seeing that their peers are progressing on a different track. I think that um, manifests itself in a way that takes a toll, not only on them, but on the the peers who are learning in school. So I think having um, them do their learning after the end of the, the normal school day also would be a benefit. Um, so the, this really is to provide um, stipends and transportation for a small group of students who um, we're really having a hard time getting to graduation. Yes? Um, the majority or all of these students, have they already passed their MCAS or is something embedded in this? Where those students who haven't, we'd have some sort of a help them. 
Yeah. I'm going to defer to Mr. Lombardi on that. Question is, for students in this, do you, students we've been talking about, have yes. they typically passed MCAS? Some have, some haven't. Some have passed one or two. It really, it really you know, the hope for this would be to really individualize, as Dr. Provo said, that some students might be just need a, um, a Monday history class. Yeah, so it, but, it, but it's geared to be as individualized as possible to meet their needs. Yes. Can you talk about the transportation component of this? It, just because we've talked so much about a later bus at the high school, and if you're going to be providing transportation for 10 students, I wonder if that's so the this will be one of the Northampton owned buses um, as we thought about the different um, possible options for transporting the students the cheapest way was to pay one of our drivers a couple of extra hours to come back and essentially do a fourth tier after dropping off the elementary students so it, it wouldn't really be a late school bus option I don't think because it's going to be a small bus okay. Do they, oh. Ahead. No. Oh. Have we ever done anything like this before in Northampton, a Twilight Academy, or I mean, just out of curiosity that you know of? I don't know it, historically if we have. I know that we haven't in my time here. Yeah. No. Mr. Lombardi is saying no. <laughs> saying no? Mr. Lombardi is okay. saying no. Okay. Okay. Yep. Do you pay less for a small bus? <laughs> or do we not own big buses? I'm sorry. We don't own big buses. We aspire to. We aspire. <laughs> okay. Uh, moving on uh, to our last new program and our last one major. Um, this is a grant funded position. We normally <coughs> talk about the grants in the uh, budget, but we got a little bit of one major crazy. Um, so, we uh, do have a grant in to bring Cisco Academy <coughs> to Northampton High School. Um, we think this would be a nice complement to our IT pathway. Um, really the goal is to teach students networking skills, um, which is a very highly in demand skill in the, the local marketplace. Um, so again, going back to my uh, theme of relevance, hands-on learning, um, providing different pathways for students. Um, one of the things that I said in um, sort of my interview as part of the district review is the strength of the high school can also be its weakness, um, which is it's a very strong academic high school, but it doesn't provide a lot in terms of hands-on learning or um, potential career readiness for students who think that they may want to work for a while before going to college. Um, so this will be a way of continuing to expand that um, if we get the grant. If we don't get the grant, there's no, uh, there's no impact on the budget because we just don't do it, but we're hopeful. Um, and then another no cost thing, and it also is connected to um, trying to create better learning outcomes for kids is bringing one of our preschool classes to the high school. Um, if you notice um, down on the side by the church, there's a playground. There used to be a preschool there. This one I can't say we did in the past. Um, one of the things that we've found is um, one of our most effective interventions <coughs> for some of the students who are right on the margin of disengaging with school is working with younger children. And we actually have a formal program right now where students from the high school go over to Jackson Street School. I think it's weekly. Um, and it brings out an entirely different side of the kids. Um, they are now the role models. They, something changes and they know that um, they have to represent something for the, the young kids they're working with. And we think that they could benefit from that on a more regular basis. Um, so bringing the, high, the preschool to the high school is not um, just to locate it there, but it's also to have some connection um, with some of our at-risk students at the high school who really benefit from that. Uh, the other part of this is we are running out of space at Leeds. Um, there's a one-year contract extension on the Clark School, which I can only <coughs> recommend if we make this move. Um, so when we met as a 
uh, budget and property subcommittee um, that they gave me uh, authority to, to negotiate that um, last year but if we don't move the preschool then I would say my negotiation would be we need to shrink the space of Clark because we're going to need some more room at Leeds if we move one of the preschools from Leeds to the high school that alleviates that problem at least for a year yes miss uh, sorry, sorry. Um, I think that this is really exciting I think that um, you know we have a community there I mean that it's that a preschool could be in another neighborhood is really great because it means less traveling for the kids and for parents. Um, and I was, <laughs> in our last meeting, um, Principal Lombardi presented on the high school, some of the high school programs, and one of the ones that I meant to highlight, and I wonder if it connects to this, is that there is a pathway to help um, students who are interested in educational careers. Was that correct? So, do you want to speak to that? Um, <laughs> that when you came last time and presented on the high school program that there was a pathway for students who were interested in engaging in education at an earlier age would I did I read that wrong yeah, there was some sort of early education There's the early education or I'm I, sorry oh, that I don't have the thing yeah in front um, of me. we have a um, I know we have a program that goes over to Jackson Street. We have students, a service learning program that um, I'm not recalling a pathway for early. It's not a pathway. It's not like the innovative pathway. It's not this. It's not in the same thing. Okay. No. Okay. No. Then I misread it in the. Sorry. Okay. Um, you kind of catch me up. I'm trying to remember my last presentation of pathways. I'm trying to. Um, it was going to be uh, some child. It was in the program of some some child program development of classes at the high school, yeah. and they were going to uh, volunteer at maybe just Jackson Street in the classroom for two yeah, days. It's a like our service learning program, yes. That we so have. it's a service learning program, and it's actually already been instituted. So it's not a new program; it's already been going on. <laughs> we actually started a couple years before, I think, going to Ryan Road um, for, for that. I see. Okay, okay. Well, this connects really nicely to that, and I think that that program just looked amazing, and I meant to compliment you all on that program. Sorry. I will, I will, no, I, I will also throw out that you may remember I submitted an innovation pathway for an education yes. preparation program, but the state rejected that. So okay. maybe okay. now we could be a time to resubmit. Yeah. Um, okay. Mr. Coffin. Thank you. Um, so I, I appreciate what Ms. Burnham was bringing up. I had a similar question because maybe you sat down too early, Mr. Lombardi, I'm not sure. But one of the things that excited me about this service learning or pathway, whatever it was, was the combination of in-class child development course mm -hmm. and practical yeah. work with kids during the week. Does that, is that something that we heard correctly or did? I'm sorry, I, re I really am. Yes, having, yeah. okay. it was in the... Um, well, I guess my question is if there is a child development course at the high school. No, um, currently there is not, no. And not next year? No. Hmm. Okay. I read that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I, I'll, I'll pull up. I, I, yeah. so, but, uh, but currently, for example, the days that students involved in the program are not going to the elementary school, yeah. the classwork they're doing is on that related content. Is on what? That related content for the child right. development stuff. Yeah. So, okay. home, so like, intermittent or interspersed, I should say, between the days that they're going on site, they're covering this type of material in that one. Yeah. Independent study? No, in no, no, no. class run by the teacher that's affiliated with the class that leads that group, most power group. It's also yeah. college yeah. service learning, so it might also be sp yeah. spreading good cheer, spreading good spread, spreading goodwill. Um, yeah. Yeah, like I, I guess I, but, but we might have had the same idea. I, I was, I think <laughs> it was just that if the if the kids are working in the preschool, if you can if you can um, support that with some academic instruction, learning on child development, it would be a win-win. If it's not just working with kids, yeah, so that, any way you can infuse that would be an even better way to offer Absolutely. students. Yeah. That's all. Service I learning I course wasn't geared in that specific pathway for preschool or education was more for students to have an opportunity yeah. to, re to engage um, with the community, um, a sense of self-worth, um, to yeah. give back altruism, empathy, things like, th like that. That was the real model for that, especially for those students of high needs and high risk. Okay. Sounds good. Um, and I had a couple of other, can I continue? Sure. Thank you. Um, so Dr. 
provost, again, like I pointed out when Mr. Lombardi shared the uh, student handbook last time, it was such an impressive list of electives that we have and seems to be growing. I just want to say that the, the idea of kids participating in this, I hope we don't see as an alternative to college. These are, I think, wonderful opportunities for kids to experiment, to get their hands dirty, to um, apply some of what they're learning in class to make their decisions around college easier and maybe more relevant for them. So I think it's a dual a dual sort of opportunity for kids to both experience that before they go on to college as well as the kids who might not be going on. But I would think m m many of those kids that do participate probably will get some additional learnings as well. I totally agree. Okay. Um, especially within the pathway, one of the specific goals is to give them exposure to post-secondary education. Great. The yeah. idea though is that you don't have to be on this track or model that says you graduate from high school and three months later you start college unless you want that. Yeah. You could work and go to college. You could work for a while, save some money and then go to college. It's just an opportunity to provide students with more options yeah. but not a, try, a way to try to close any options for students. Okay. I think I'm saying the same thing. So I also, Dr. Plummer, I think um, you might be the one who developed this post-grad transition coordinator position or is Recommend it. Yeah, so I just want to say um, that I think it's totally awesome, really awesome, and it's not just because we were cited on it, and I think you know my background, and it's, it's something which I felt we've needed for a while. The outcomes for students with disabilities nationwide um, is just far, far less, uh, those kids are far less successful than their non-disabled peers, and it's been historical and going on for far too long, so I think the services and support for students with disabilities for life after high school when students leave high school are really insufficient, and the problem is, although we have like transition planning beginning at 14, um, there's just a gap between what we can offer and what the needs of the students are. So I like where you're going with this. My question is, um, the, we have the bulk of students with disabilities do graduate with their peers at 6, 17, or 18 years old at 12th grade. And those kids do also, historically, and research will show they also have um, worse, or they, they struggle more than their non-disabled peers, whether they go on to college, whether they can access services, whether they know of the services, many different things. And I think that's what the transitioning planning process and law was about. So my question is, are there, in your mind, are there going to be um, other opportunities for this person or to assist the other students who are not in school between 18 and 22 um, also with their transition planning? Yeah, I certainly, I think that they're there's a core group of students, I had a meeting for one today, that I feel like um, we really try to make connections with the community in terms of experiences early on. I've only been in this position for a year and a half, but um, really it's, uh, it, there's so many opportunities, so many districts do it differently. Um, I put a lot of energy into this and I feel like um, it's not nearly as much as I feel like needs to go into it um, for students. So certainly some much more intensive programming, 18 to 22. Yeah. A lot of those students, we start thinking about opportunities 14 and above. I was just telling Dave today, I read three IEPs today that included transition planning forms for kids who aren't even 14 that are starting to think about. Yeah. I think the piece that is exciting to me when I see all these things here is it's all connected. It's about making school more meaningful and um, and creating opportunities along the way. So it's internships in the building, it's internships out of the building, it's working with young kids within the building, it's working with kids throughout the community, and it's having a person whose position is kind of to like be out there thinking about this stuff yeah, all the great, time. Great. With us, partnered with us, making sure these things can happen. Great. But um, to begin with, targeting the kids who are 18 to 22. Absolutely. Yep. For sure that is yep. a, a, an absolute focus that has to happen, but I think, I, I really believe, I mean at this point we don't we, it's, it's, this is a position that's embedded in multiple people's jobs every day, and I feel yeah. like anything yeah. on top of what we're doing right now is just going to give us a chance to grow totally. tremendously. Yeah. So certainly focusing very much so on those students who need the skills to be able to, to transition through the 18 to 22. Right. But beyond that, we are also making really strong connections with MRC and our pre ETS program. So that that's the kind of stuff that kids with um, you know, specific learning disabilities who need help with soft skills um, and interview skills and learning how to um, write resumes. Those are all things that are growing at the high school level, yep. but it's sort of trickling down also. Right. Um, so yeah, I yeah. definitely see the main, 
the, the absolute focus to be on helping to provide really rich, meaningful, helpful services for 18 to 22, but also the kids who yeah. are at the high school level, anybody with disabilities who's transitioning. Yeah, thank you so much. Do you think that, um, have you explored uh, combining this half time with another district's half time? Um, stamped in Amherst and Silk, because there could be some real effort, some there could the be special. some real advantage and efficiencies. Yeah, we just met recently, and so there's a few local special ed directors we've started talking about how these positions exist, and it is interesting. I mean, when I go to these uh, meetings for the region, I'm one of the only special ed directors that's there, or student services directors. A lot of districts have coordinators that are like, this is their job, right? Every day they're coming up with unique opportunities and connections to the community. Yeah. Um, so we're kind of behind, we're definitely late in the game to right. have a position like this. Um, so it is possible that there's somebody out there that's working part time that would want to combine with us. Well, if there's another district, I mean, I, if we had a full time, if we shared a full time person, just yeah. even like yeah. uncovering community Good. partnerships and understanding yeah. how the, the adult system works, yeah. you can learn that for two districts at one time. I think there would be a beautiful way to yeah. increase the amount of uh, support that we have for kids by combining that. And I know. Dr. Provost meets with other superintendents, you meet with other people, personnel service directors. We just need someone else who's excited about this like you are and yeah. willing to put up half the money. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, moving along to meeting the needs of a changing population. We have a section here on specialty teaching services. Um, we continue to struggle to meet what I think was a, a long-standing personnel deficit in the area of ESL. Um, you know, we've added ESL teachers, I think, every single budget that I've uh, pre prepared for you. So we're continuing that process this year, or proposing to continue that process this year by adding .2 FTE at Bridge Street, .4 FTE at Jackson Street, .6 FTE at JFK Middle School, um, as well as that additional special education teacher for JFK Middle School that I alluded to earlier in the presentation. Um, so, you know, you see, the, when you see little points like this, know what we're doing is filling out positions, basically. Um, also, um, one of the things that is really important, I think it goes to the topic of um, equity and diversity. I think it goes to one of the um, groups that sometimes feels like is not included in um, our lens of diversity is individuals with disabilities. And just as it's important to hire uh, a diverse faculty, a racially diverse faculty, it's also important to hire a faculty that includes individuals with disabilities to provide role models for students with disabilities. Um, so we um, have been successful, I would say, uh, in recruiting a number of employees with disabilities. However, we've never had an account or a place um, to charge the costs of providing the accommodations for our employees with disabilities. This is um, like, I say $10,000 to open the account. It's not like we're playing poker here, but um, <laughs> much like the um, addition we made to the budget last year to just put a placeholder to begin building an account for textbooks, um, this is a place to put a, a placeholder to begin um, building the account for accommodations for our employees with disabilities. Um, this is not the amount needed. Right now the amount is taken from building based budgets in other places, but it's starting to build up a fund that we know that when we hire someone who needs an accommodation, we have a, a line item to hit for the whatever um, is needed to provide the accommodation. Next is providing adequate administrative support. Um, first is a Section 504 coordinator, which is a split position between JFK and the high school. Earlier, I spoke about the high numbers of students with IEPs in grades seven and eight. Additionally, there are more than 100 students at JFK and the high school who have Section 504 plans. Um, in terms of procedural safeguards, paperwork requirements, evaluation, team process, etc., Section 504 mimics special education. Unlike special education, however, there are no, there is no funding or staff that goes with the statute um, to monitor that process. So as the number of 504 plans have increased at JFK and the high school, responsibilities have shifted to various positions, always with the same result, 
which is that the person who is now doing the 504 work was not doing nearly as much of the work that they were actually hired to do in the first place. Um, so this is an attempt to try to get ahead of that dynamic by just hiring one person to be in place of um, monitoring and ensuring all parts of the Section 504 process are um, followed through at both the, the middle school and high school. Also, um, additional clerical staff um, we're proposing one FTE for the Special Services Office. Um, you should know that at one point in time there were four, now there are two. Um, we think three is actually the appropriate number. I think that because of my own observations of the staff, uh, a lot of what they do are things in addition to administrative tasks that could be done by by administrative support, or be done with administrative support. I see them proofreading IEPs. I see them proofreading IEPs when I leave on Friday. I see that little light up there and I go and tell them go home, but they're insubordinate. Or if they, or if they do go home, they take the IEPs with them to read. Um, so I think that building them up uh, to that not full staffing level that they were at before, but I think the right staffing level of adding one um, would be very helpful for that dynamic. Also, we think that the the clerical staff at Jackson Street and Leeds Elementary, our two biggest elementary schools, should be increased from 35 hours to 40 hours. You see the cost of that. That's an annual cost for each of those schools. Um, these people are sorely tempted to work without pay, um, and we want to stop that because that's illegal. Um, so we want to make sure that we give them the time to do the work they need to do. Next, um, enhanced arts and math education. These are high school faculty. Um, those of you who were a part of the commissioner's <coughs> visit to NHS will remember an extremely crowded calculus classroom. The demand for computer science and higher level math classes has really stretched the math department. Um, this position would primarily reduce the size of some of those larger sections as we anticipate continued and maybe even increased demand for computer science and higher level math classes. Also last year we began a process of bringing all of the music teachers, or the two music teachers at the high school, up to full time. We did um, one of the teachers last year, this increase would uh, complete that process by bringing the other teacher to full time. Um, making this addition would allow us to add a course um, with a focus on music production. Our hope is that by offering a course like that we could expand beyond um, the current courses that really have more of an appeal for student with background in vocal or instrumental music and may hit a new um, type of student who may not come with a lot of preparation in either of those areas but may have um, an interest in music nonetheless. And then a few things to improve the quality of the experience. First is air conditioning. Uh, I can guarantee that this is a very important issue for teachers. Um, there, one of the things that um, you'll recall from the capital improvement plan is that we had asked and has been uh, approved to this point in the process to have the library at Ryan Road School air conditioned. It's the only school we have currently that doesn't have a large air conditioned space. Um, so putting that in place um, over the summer will certainly give us a lot more capacity to deal with some of the warm days in September and June. Also, um, 31 window units. We've identified with the administration and teachers some of this, the classrooms that are most susceptible to high temps. Um, these are classes that are not only susceptible to high temperatures, but also are not already air conditioned for um, students with medical needs. Um, so the addition of these, along with I believe it's $75,000 of wiring that's included in the capital budget to upgrade service so that we can actually run the air conditioners, I think will um, be a really good faith show of um, our, our interest in trying to improve the, the cooling capacities of the schools. Um, and then finally, um, we want to set aside some money for bathroom equity. 
several female students reached out to me this year to explain that we do not provide for their needs to the same extent that we provide for the needs of boys in bathrooms. Um, and so I'd like to reserve a small portion of the funds we have available to try some solutions to that problem so that female students can feel more comfortable, more respected in our schools. Can I, can I ask a question? Sure. sure. Sorry, I don't know if anyone else has a hand up. Um, you're the only one. Yep, you're not. You're up. Can I say a few more words about the window air conditioning units, in particular, how you see them being used, how often they would be on, under what conditions would they be turned on, and who pays the electric bill, where that comes out of the budget? The uh, electric bill comes out of the utilities line item in the budget. Uh, Unlike the high school, where we have central control to turn either the whole school on or the whole school off, I would uh, rely on teachers and principals to use their judgment on when to turn on the, the, the window units. Um, I, I, I think that's the only way to know whether or not they're needed is to let the people who are in the rooms decide. Do we know how much it costs to run a window unit per day? I do not. I, I guess I would like to have a better understanding, um, in particular just having some district-wide understandings on when we would have air conditioners on. Certainly, you know, the conditions we heard about earlier this year were absolutely unacceptable, but you could imagine days where we aren't turning air conditioners on when we you know, in some schools where it's controlled at a higher level um, and certainly letting teachers decide sounds reasonable but it also feels important to have a better sense of the impact on the energy usage for many reasons including the budget and I can think about that a little bit offline or maybe somebody there can but it, I'd like to know how much these things are going to cost to run since we're adding it into the budget, uh, we're adding this as an ongoing expense. I'm, I'm sure that Cammie and I could come up with some estimates for you. Thanks. And so those are all of the programming pieces of the budget. Next, uh, we also are proposing to increase substitute pay. This also is very important to, I would say, members of every single unit as well as the administrators. You may have heard that um, there are some times when people are out and we can't find anybody to replace them. Um, I don't know if this will make the difference, but every year we've tried to keep adding money to the substitute pay to try to make it more attractive. So our proposal is to increase non-licensed teachers from $82 a day to $85 a day, licensed teachers from $87 a day to $87, I mean $82 a day to $87 a day. For the retired MPS teachers, we're not um, recommending any increase, but they have a very significant benefit that places them above the licensed teachers, which is that if they work any portion of the day, they get $87. That's their current practice. So um, they, that 87 is like with an asterisk or an enhancement. Um, so then all other subs are currently making 11 or 11.15 an hour, and the proposal would be to raise them to $12 an hour. Total cost of that is just shy of $30,000. Question? I didn't see who went up first, so go ahead, then I'll come back here. Okay, so does, doesn't the city have um, kind of a, a um, hasn't the city decided to try and pay people $15 at a minimum an hour? What am no, I trying to say? What? No, the city, um, the city council passed an order, ordinance yeah. that's not, that only applies to municipal employees. Right. I get That says we'll pay the minimum wage, which we do. So it was one of those. Which is? I uh, won't we'll characterize what I thought of it, but, um, but which is $12, $12 an hour. An hour. Right. And I say, all right, yeah. but so. I mean, I, I, I guess I would throw out there if we've considered, does anybody in the school district make less than 15 an hour other than the subs? I think potentially depending on where they are in the grid. I don't know if anyone actually is. But, you know, less than 15, yes. I do. There's a few. 
minimum wage in the state is going to go up to 15 over the next few years. I understand, but I, I but I but I do think that is supportive of many of the other efforts in Northampton and just common sense. I mean, I, I would I would support the idea of raising that even more if we can. I, when we look at how much it's going to cost, it's not as significant as some of the other costs, but certainly raising ESPs, I guess a dollar an hour is going to be six thousand dollars per. Um, but, um, well, a couple of slides from here, we'll talk about school lunch prices, and I think part of that money, we can raise the money some other way, I would just throw out there that and, and see if anybody supports me on this idea, but I think if we can raise it more than 212 and closer to 15 would be a very worthwhile endeavor on our part. Mr. Zahowski. I just, I had a little bit more to say about that. Um, and it just had to do with minimum wage. It seems like because of the way that our fiscal years run, there's always a time where when we look at the, the $12 uh, number, knowing that in 2020, I think it's going up to 1275. So there'll be that six months where we are paying employees minimum wage, but then it drops down below again. So I think I'm hearing what Mr. Kaufman's saying. I think it would always be nice to think that our employees are at least making what minimum wage is. We're in a, co you know, we're in a, um, a competitive, competitive environment where folks are looking for jobs, and if minimum wage is the the least amount that they can get paid on an hourly basis, it would be nice that we were at least be trying to compete with these, those other people out there that are paying that. So. You know, as I look at that, you know, I guess that would be 75 cents. That would get us through the 2020 or to that point. I don't know what the numbers would be on that, but it would be certainly something of a slight increase, mm -hmm. and it would cover it for for the employees up until the, the, the next, next fiscal year. Another option would be to do a staggered rate and do, you know, $12 at the beginning and then 12.75. I have no I, I have no idea if it's holding back or it's making it difficult to to get substitutes for sure, or it's less attractive. I just think it, it's fair that we be paying folks what the state has, you know, established for minimum wage. So let us think about both of those as we do the next round of this. So next, we are showing the net program increases by cost center. This coming back around to my opening comments, you can see that unlike prior years where the majority of the additional programming focused on changes at the elementary schools, here we're now more balanced, slightly tipped towards the secondary schools. There you can see the impact by cost center. And then, Sorry. yep. Going back. Uh, can you just speak to the line item about athletics? Sure. This is a combination of the program increases within, the proposed program increases within athletics. It's coaches' salaries, it's materials and supplies. Um, so just the this. kind of normal contractual obligations. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. Got it. Would this be linked to what I saw recently on a posting for um, site site managers as well? Do you know? Well, site managers are already in this year's budget, so mm -hmm. there's not an increase for site managers for next year. So next, proposed fee increases. Um, we've spoken many times about the lunch price and whether it's possible to continue to maintain it at the current level whether it's wise to try to maintain it at the current level. Um, so at this time, I'll notify the committee that we're projecting a deficit increase of about $18,000 in food services this year. Um, so you know there's sort of this structural $40,000 deficit that's baked into the pie. This year, um, that will increase to $58,000 to our best thinking uh, at this time. That's not because of reduced participation. Um, we've actually had some increases in participation. However, the product we're selling is more costly now and labor costs have gone up. So the program is um, running larger deficits. So we'll rec the recommendation we have for you is to split 
the difference of the eighteen thousand dollars with the consumers essentially so we think that adding a ten cent increase to the lunch will yield nine thousand dollars we would recommend increasing the lunch subsidy by nine thousand um, dollars we do think this is probably or likely to be one step in a process of, of future fee increases that may be necessary but we think it's a reasonable first step um, it doesn't uh, affect breakfast at all and um, doesn't affect reduced prices at all the, the debt the debt projection does that take into consideration uncollected debt from folks not paying I don't think that's that's the bad debt I think that's just the operational deficit am I right about that correct it's just the operational piece that the, the regular amount of debt that we're budgeting for is the constant hold that we can collect the rest of it sure <coughs> mr. Sansky I'm just curious about the calculation on the additional 10 cents I thought we were told before that every five cent increase yields thirty five hundred dollars but if we're saying this is gonna 10 cents will equal nine thousand no I double checked it so the 10 cents will bring in just about eight thousand dollars so there would be about ten thousand more in the budget that would be budgeted for okay and uh, eight thousand dollars would be raised by the other ten cents with eighty eighty thousand meals got it and then moving on to bus pass this one could have a um, a little bit less predictable outcome our proposal is to bring in a completely different fee structure so we would be raising costs across the board but also offering a 10 percent discount if for any year-long passes paid by June 30th which would bring the price below the current price um, so this could be a net um, increase for us or a net decrease depending on when people pay their bills um, the main benefit is that we hope that it motivates people to get their passes in early so that we don't have to spend the month of September reworking bus routes um, the uh, other benefit is we we have received I should just let the committee know some uh, I guess I'll call it cool feedback from uh, the the capital committee the, the committee that sort of screens the capital projects um, and, you know one of the things that is constantly on that um, list are the replacement schedule of buses and um, part of that is paid for by bus fees and part of that is paid for by the capital program and some of the um, members said well you know it's not really responsible business practice to not build a um, cola increase into your fee based services um, other businesses raise prices slowly over time schools should raise prices slowly over time and not rely on this capital budget to, to um, pull them out so anyways that would at least address that concern that's been raised um, and what I hope to get out of it not as that because I think we can work past that but earlier bus passes which would be very helpful for us Ms. Hennessy I appreciate that I guess what I hate about it is that people who could afford to pay the full thing get the benefit of a discount and the people who can't afford it have to pay over trimester get no benefit I just think that's not a good thing that we should maybe I get that it's a pain to figure out the bus routes but I'm gonna get a nice benefit from that because I could pay it early um, I just don't think that's fair I don't think that's what we should be about so it's my, my Ms. Pusansky well, I'm, I, I was gonna I had another point to make but I am kind of curious do you is your sense dr. provost that people get the trimester pass because they can't pay for the year or because they're involved in sports etc and changing circumstances sports <coughs> yeah that was kind of my sense okay. but the other, the other thing a really good point Ms. Hennessy. I'm sorry the, the other thing that drives trimester passes is students know they'll be getting their license mm-hmm so trimester passes are those generally for the high school students then it sounds like if it's athletics and well I mean I, those I, two okay. those those two examples are high school based so uh, those are ones that to my mind I know about okay. I'm not saying that middle school and elementary school parents never do that but okay. I was just trying to circle back to, to a couple of the Anne's point to just it would be nicer to have some data on it because I think that that's really true 
that people, it's really hard to put out a huge amount of money in one slog. So I, I really agree with that. Hi. Oh, sorry, go okay. ahead. I, I'm curious if you see these fees, you're, what you mentioned about sort of a COLA increase, do you see these fees increasing now yearly or, I mean, what? how do you see this moving forward? I'm not sure. Based I'm on not, that kind of. I don't know what outcome this would have if we do it. Um, it could be that it nets less fees, right? And I might say it was a bad idea, let's go back to the old way. Mm -hmm. um, I do know that, uh, the bus fee has been stable for a long time. Um, one of the things that we were thinking about in terms of which fees could be included this year is the last thing we raised fees on were athletics. So we felt like, okay, the next ones to come up probably should be lunch and bus pass. Um, so I think there's kind of a rotation concept built into that. Um, but I, I think that they can't stay the same price forever. Right, and athletics were last raised three or four years ago, right? I think it was very... I'd say three. Okay, got it. I just believe, you know, in managing people's expectations, so it'd be good for, you know, the public if we're going to move to a system where we're starting to raise fees a little bit annually or if it's going to be sort of on a rotation basis, it might just be good to let folks know so they know what's coming moving forward. Just a real quick point. Just heading back to the, uh, the lunch prices, I was looking back at... Uh, uh, Excel spreadsheet that I think you put together, Dr. Provost. But even if we go to 285, based on the other, um, this chart has 18 school districts on it, including Northampton. So if we can compare them to even with that increase, we'll be on the lower half. So just for the public to know that even though it's going up, it probably will, it may go up. It's not going up. Uh, it'll still be cheaper than most of our most of our local districts. Sure. Lunch pricing. And so here's our revised fiscal stability plan. You'll see that it uh, looks basically the same that it did last year. We're dipping in about a million dollars to reserves this year um, to make the budget work. Um, and the year that we run out of money, we still project to be FY22, um, absent any change in the fundamentals of our revenues and expenses. And so I just want to thank everybody who helped out with the budget proposal and all those weeks from Thanksgiving until now, um, particularly the budget and property subcommittee, the alt team, everybody who responded to the budget survey. I didn't say this when I was presenting, but I should say this now. Um, the budget survey overwhelmingly said that it's the specialty teaching services that we need more of. Um, so I, that slide that talks about specialty teaching services is in align with what alignment with what the public and teachers felt was most needed um, and especially Cami Lamica uh, on her first <laughs> run through this so the public comment period begins now as I said this was tweeted out a couple of hours ago it's on the website <coughs> now so send us your comments by email to phone public comment period at the March 14th or 28th school committee meeting There has been now this presentation. Um, item five is the public comment period that would normally be at the front of the meeting. So is there anyone who wishes to make public comment now at this time? Okay. I mean, it's a lot to, to think about, so go home, think about it. There's other ways to give public comment. So, um, okay. So with that, thank you, Dr. Provo. So we now have, um, a couple of just future business and meeting dates to announce. We've got the school committee meeting of March 14th, 2019 at 6.45 p.m. in the JFK Community Room. We have the Rules and Policy Subcommittee of March 25th, 2019 at 12 p.m. in the Superintendent's Office. And we've got the school committee budget meeting, which is the follow-on, uh, March 28th, 2019 at 6.45 p.m. in the JFK Community Room. Next, uh, there is a... Um, before we do that? Sure. Um, normally the school committee gives me their sense of whether they want us to put this into a budget book or whether... Okay. 
they think we're on the wrong path. Okay. Because that would be delivered at the next meeting, typically. Okay. So do folks want to give a sense of the, how this first view budget, are, are there areas where um, it needs to be rethought, or can this be put at least into a budget book format for the next deliberations? Any sense of the committee? Yes, Ms. Fallon. Um, I appreciate the collaboration that's been done by the all team and members of the diversity committee, and I would be very comfortable with you moving forward with um, the budget that you've put forward. Ms. Pisansky. Uh, yep, I, I agree. I think we gave you some direction on some areas we'd like to explore, and uh, but beyond that, I think it's really ready probably to go to the next step. I'm seeing other nodding heads, so. Yeah, I certainly would agree. Um, once again, looking just at, even at the last slide in um, our district stability plan, uh, and seeing that we are finally getting into the reserve area, which is something that we haven't had to do in a number of years. But knowing for a number of years that we were going to find a time where we would have to and not have to discuss what we're cutting. So I thought. Uh, Dr. Provost's um, comments and presentation tonight uh, was, was wonderful as we're looking at our district, looking at a lot of the achievements we've made in the elementary schools and trying to now move in the new direction um, of looking kind of up into the middle school and the high school. And honestly, having the opportunity to be able to do that with funds that are still available and not having to try to do a lot of reprogramming like superintendent has said that he's done before um, I think we're, we're still in a really we're in a really solid position um, for our school district and I, I, I give the credit not to the superintendent alone because I don't think he would take it but to the entire all team and everyone that's participated in making this budget what it is for for us to be able to vote on so putting it into a formal book seems like the next step and I would support that for sure. Other comments? Okay. Does that give you the direction yes, you need? Okay, excellent. So on the next item on the agenda um, is a request for an executive session, and I would ask the vice chair if he would uh, if he would make the formal motion on that. Sure. Could I borrow your language? Oh, sure, Ken. Yep. That's all. I make a motion. Uh, purpose of executive session a request for an executive session under Massachusetts general law open meeting chapter 38 section 22 a 2 discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with the Northampton Association of school employees whereas an open session would have a detrimental uh, effect on further details yeah. and compromise yeah. the reason for going into an executive session okay so there's been a motion made is there a second Okay, seconded by Ms. Hennessy. I'll ask the clerk to call a roll call vote. Uh, voting in the affirmative is to go into executive session. Voting negative is to not go into executive session. Uh, who are that? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Ms. Susan Ross? Yes. Yes. I yes, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so there has been a vote to move into executive session. I do need to announce to the public that we will indeed be moving into an executive session because to do s have this uh, meeting in open session would be detrimental to the uh, school committee's bargaining position. I also need to tell the public that we will adjourn from executive session. We will not return to open session. So thank you very much.